Angelou once said that there's no agony like bearing an untold story inside of you. Now, my question with this quote is, what do we do when these untold stories that's buried within us are the stories about ourselves? Today, I hope to use my passion for music and leadership to construct a, a beat on stage to show you the, the importance of self-narration and knowing the importance of your own story. Uh, what I will be doing is linking sounds to personal events and things of importance within my life, then layering these sounds to harmoniously come together to what I call my personal musical narrative. Now, the idea behind self-narrative and self-narration of the importance uh, came from an uh, interpersonal leadership course that I took uh, while here at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Tony Andonoro is, is our teacher there, and within that course, um, two of my friends, Brandon Telg and Daniel Barber, as well as myself, uh, we were charged with a group project to go out into the community and create an impact. That was it. We had the freedom to go out and choose however we wanted to create impact and evoke change. Now, within this interpersonal leadership course, uh, we all had 20-minute narratives. The baseline was 20. It could go on for two hours, three hours, however, many, however much time you needed to get your story across. Now, within these narratives, we were allowed to self-reflect and unpack the many things that made us who we were. Now, everyone within this class found this extremely therapeutic, and we noticed that even as graduate students, we hadn't had the opportunity to self-reflect and tell our own story. So when it came time to evoke this change and create an impact, we knew we wanted to have something to do with narration. So we looked online and, and Brandon Telg found a concept called uh, Tell Me Your Story and We'll Give You a Dollar. Now we thought this was perfect because for one, we're in college, everybody's broke. <laughs> so if you can come up and tell me anything about yourself of importance, you can tell me whatever you want. It can be as big, as small as you want it to be, as long as it's about you and we'll give you a dollar. So we set up camp at Turlington Plaza and Wrights Union, expecting to go broke from all the stories we were going to hear. Well, the crazy thing is, we couldn't pay you guys to tell us your story. <laughs> it was bad, because I mean, I got changed for a 20 and left with probably $18, still in my pocket. It was bad. So we were sitting there like, we don't understand what's going on. People just walk by. Now, it might have been the sign that was done with a little marker with a dollar tape to it, but we thought the organic feel would actually make it a little bit better. But <laughs> I, I guess they were like, no, there's something, something going on. So we wanted to ask a few of the people who actually took the time to come and talk to us. What was the catch? Why weren't people telling us their stories? Um, they told us two things. One, they thought that it was a catch. No one just gives you a dollar for free. But two, they didn't feel like they had a story that was important enough to tell. Now, the second thing was, the second reason was disheartening because each one of us has a story to tell. Our stories are equally important and precious and will provide us with all the self-motivation and anything that we ever need. As time moved on, more and more people began to migrate to the table. Uh, those that did produce, uh, that, di that decided to talk to us, they brought their friends and we started to get this little, this, this culture, this culture group of people who, who wanted to just be enlightened and, 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 and feel this therapeutic activity of just telling their own story, having their opportunity to self-reflect. So we felt that this project was so important that we still carry on these projects today in the rights and in Turlington when time allows. Uh, also, he started a group called Self Narration where we just really encourage people to come out and meet and just tell their own stories because there's so much strength in each story. So, what I want to do today is construct a beat on stage and show you my personal musical narrative. So, when I think about the things that are important to me, I have to think about what were my influences. So, Let's talk about the hip hop portion. Now, the reason why I do hip hop beats is because when I was around 10 and younger, uh, there, there are certain things that your parents try to keep you away from. And a lot of that is choice lyrics. So when I was younger, I wasn't able to listen to a lot of rap and hip hop because those things I probably shouldn't hear when I'm eight. Now, of course, naturally, because these are the things my mother told me I could not listen to, that's exactly what I fell in love with. So what I would do is when she wasn't around, I would secretly record things off of the radio, uh, make these little things called mixtapes, and I record them on cassettes. Now for those of you who don't know what a cassette tape is, it's this small rectangular device that hooks up to, it plugs in or goes into this big box called a radio, and it catches these sound waves out of the air magically and puts them on to the tape. Now for those who don't know what a radio is, it's this really big box <laughs> that magically takes these sounds out and, 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 and streams this music that's not through a smartphone or a computer. 
I'm starting to sound older than, than I want to on stage, but anyway, I digress. So I knew that, uh, I knew that the lyrics, I didn't quite understand them because I was eight, but I always found myself entranced by the beats that these lyrics were recited over. So it was also at this time that I recall looking out the window after I heard police sirens come through my neighborhood and I saw my really good childhood friend. I'm an only child, but he was one of my friends in the neighborhood that I felt like was a big brother. Um, he was running away from the police, going down the street, running into his home because they wanted to question him about a few activities. I was really upset because I knew him. That was my good friend, that was my big brother. That was the one who I played soccer with, basketball, uh, street hockey. He was the guy who came and played Nintendo with me. He kept the bullies away because according to the neighborhood, I might have had a crooked smile. You know, he was that guy who always made me feel important and, and, and accepted. I was disappointed because as I saw him running, I saw that he had started to allow outside influences to define his story. Someone else was writing his narrative. I didn't know how to understand this. I didn't know what to do, but I knew this wasn't a reflection of us. I knew he was a good kid, had a good heart, and he just wanted some opportunities outside of those that our small town of Winterville, North Carolina would allow to us. So with that being said, I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. So at the tender age of 12, I think I was, I ran to the kitchen and I wrote, the miseducation of my Negro generation. And basically what this was, was an open letter to all the rappers, entertainers, and anyone else who oversaturated entertainment with this fictitious reality that supposedly represented my culture. I asked them to please see what this was doing to my friends, what it was doing to my community and my generation. We had begun to look up and assimilate to these images that were not a true reflection of who we are. So, in conclusion, I simply asked for balance. I asked them, yes, I understand there's an industry and things that you have to do, but please just show us some motivating things, the positives. Show us some things that we could look up to and assimilate to so that we could see ourselves in their images. So from that day forth, I knew if I ever did music, it was gonna be hip hop, it was gonna be rap, it was gonna be positive, and it was gonna have a purpose. So now let's get started with the beat. Now, when I comprise a beat, I like to do it in layers. I take sounds and I layer them to make a harmonious uh, end result. Now for today, I'm going, to assign per I'm going to assign personal things of importance to me that I feel help define who I am, link them to sounds, and show you my personal musical narrative. So let's get started. Okay, now when I first think of a beat, I have to look at the tempo. Now, I like a, a, a fast tempo that can sound, that can kind of speed it up and sound really quick. But when used with different sounds, can actually be slowed down and sound very melodic and very smooth. So for this, it's going to do, I'm, my tempo will be 160 beats per minute. And I like to link this as the pace at which my mind operates and triggers. So let's hear that. Not bad. Okay, so next, now that I have my tempo and my mind is firing on all cylinders, I'm sitting and I'm thinking, what's the first thing that I want to do? What's the first thing that carries my beat? And of course, because it's rap and hip hop, and I love that, that to listen to music in my car, it's the bass line. Now, the bass line is the heart and soul of the beat. Uh, I like to refer to the bass line as the heartbeat. Now this represents the love of my mother, my grandmother, my friends and family, everybody that really just keeps me grounded, keeps me going when I don't feel like I have anything left to give. These are all those people that, that, that just truly keep me pushing on. No matter what, that heartbeat is always there. Now next, I like to add the snare. Now the snare drum usually accompanies the bass drum and helps keep the, the, the beat to go forward. Now for this, my snare drum represents those many accomplishments that you go through throughout life. Those, those special stages like your first day of school, your first day of middle school, your first day of high school, college, graduate school, your first job, your first car. Those things as you check off the list, you feel better and better about yourself.
Now, next, I like to add hi-hats and kicks. Now, hi-hats and kicks are a culmination of things. I like to think of these as my motivators. These are the progressions. These are the things that keep the, the beat going. And as, as you do more and more things, they may sound little, but they, as, as they layer, they, they bring importance to your sound. Now, these are those many motivational things, like, like my mentors, uh, any motivational quote I, I put on Facebook or Instagram, or uh, let's see what else, finding the good in every situation and establishing your own self-resilience. So let's see how it sounds with the beat. So next, I like to get into the sample. Now, I love the sample because it's one of the most important parts of the beat. Now, the sample for me, to understand how I got my ear to sample music, you have to know a little bit about my past. I grew up in a single parent home with an amazing mother named Sandra Jones, who's in the audience today. <laughs> thank you, thank you. When I was younger, she always knew it was important for me to never give up on my dream, and she felt like she had to lead by example. So she went back to school uh, and got her degree in performing arts and theater at East Carolina University. Now, while she was there, yeah. now while she was there, she always took me with her. So she also performed in a jazz ensemble there as well. So growing up, I heard big band ballads, jazz influences, Broadway tunes, things like that. So when it came time for me to hear uh, sample music, my ear naturally migrated to those sounds. So. I like to refer to the sample as the dream. Now the dream is all those little things that you knew you wanted to be when you were younger before standardized testing told you you could only select one or two. <laughs> so for me, this is me. This is, this is, this, yeah, exactly right. So this represents me wanting to be a hip hop producer, a doctor of some sort because I knew I wanted to help people. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to do? Uh, I want to be a photographer, I want to be an actor, I want to be a motivational speaker, I wanted to go to North Carolina a t State University, I want, <laughs> Aggie Pride, I wanted to go to University of Florida and get my PhD in a leadership development program, chomp chomp, and, <laughs> and ultimately come on stage and spread the message of the importance of your self-narrative. So let's listen to how the sample brings it all together. <laughs> but next, I want to do something that's very important. I want to introduce loops. Now, when a person does a loop, you can either create it yourself or you can purchase a loop from a popular producer. Now, when most people uh, purchase these loops from popular producers, it's so that they can make their beats sound a little bit more of what will possibly be played on the radio. Now, this can be good, but the only thing is when you do that, it can completely take out the originality of the beat. It can take out the essence of what you started, what you created, and can distance you from your dream. So when I think about loops and I hear them uh, when they're not the original sounds that the producer made, I think about that time when I saw my friend running down the street hiding in his house from the police and someone else, these outside influences, rewriting his narrative. Now, though these beats and loops can go at the same tempo, they can drastically change the sound of the beat. So let's hear that same original beat with these loops. Now, to some, sometimes outside influences can be good. And some people could have liked that beat a little bit better than like the original beat. But for me, it seemed to drown out the originality of myself and who I am and what I represent. So what I like to do is try my best to weed out the things that keep us from our dreams. So why is it important that you self-reflect? We must self-reflect in our past and unpack the things that create who we are and represent us. What you have is a snapshot of my sound, and I hope that you guys go home and understand the importance of your sound. Now, why is your sound important? It's important for you to understand that 
we're not just one event that happened to us or one situation to define who we are. We are actually a series of beautiful socio-constructed events that layer to create us and harmoniously intersect to make our own unique sound. Who we are is more than a two-minute elevator speech and takes more than 140 characters to explain. Maya Angelou once said that there's no agony like bearing an untold story inside of you. And today I ask you that you please do not let these stories be your own. Thank you. So thank you, Jaren. So let's say you studied the brain, and then you experienced a stroke, effectively becoming your own case study. That's the experience that our next speaker, courtesy of TED.com, will share with us today. <laughs> 